Yet again with another pertinent conversation, largely focusing on the Universal Periodic Review. What is it all about? This is a mechanism uh, through which actually, yes, um, the, Ugan the Human Rights Council, uh, human rights situations in each U. All right. This is a mechanism through which the Human Rights Council assesses the human rights situation in each um, UN member state. Its major goal is to improve human rights situations on the ground, push governments to fulfill their human rights obligations, advancing human rights for all and sharing the best practices. While the review is based on the UN Charter, UN Declaration on Human Rights and Treaties to which states are party to. From the 26th, the UPR session held between October and November of 2016, where Uganda was present, Uganda accepted one for Forty-three recommendations, and from the 143, Uganda deferred 18 and rejected 65, which touch various aspects of human rights. Uganda comes up for review in January of 2022, and this process is actually state-driven. But other key stakeholders, like the National Co the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders, have a role to play. I'm now joined by Robert Archirenga, the ED National Co Coalition for Human Rights Defenders, Uganda, Ruth Sechindi, the Director Monitoring and Inspections at the Uganda Human Rights Commission, and also Jesse Mugero, the Program associate at the International Center for Transitional Justice. A very good afternoon, gentlemen and lady. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll start with you, Robert Chirenga. Sure. The viewer would like to know what is the Universal Periodic Review? Why is it so important to talk about it right now? Thank you, Mr. Busiko. Uh, the UPR is a mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's called the Universal Periodic Review mm -hmm. under the United Nations system. So around March 2006, the General Assembly came up with a resolution mm -hmm that created what we now call the Human Rights Council that replaced the Commission on Human Rights. Now the Human Rights Council was tasked with an obligation to ensure that all human rights, uh, all countries within the United Nations, the 193 states, mm. report on how far they have fulfilled their human rights obligations mm. as provided for in the different human rights treaties. Mm. So it is under that arrangement that Uganda is going to be reviewed. We were last mm. reviewed in 2016, mm -hmm. that was under the second cycle. So the UPR takes place every four years. And so different countries have their own cycle. This time we are going to go into our cycle, which will be the third cycle, as you correctly put it in mm -hmm. February 2022. And we will be looking at how Uganda has fulfilled its human rights obligation. Mm -hmm. So all countries in the United Na uh, uh, Nations undergo this process. Mm -hmm. And basically to see how have you fulfilled your human rights obligation. It's mm -hmm. state driven in a sense that states voluntarily accept to do this work mm. and uh, all states are treated equally and the process is uniform for every state in other words the way you treat the united states is the way you treat a small country like uh, uh, somalia or uh, or uh, any other country mm. so unlike the, the the security council the human rights council every country is equal i see so our first review cycle, um, it was in 2011. Yes. Remember during the walk to work protest, so many people were rounded up and uh, kept in safe houses in Communicado. 2016, during the election, the same happened. You did even have a massacre in Kasese. Up to now, the perpetrators, including Lieutenant General Peter Eluelu, have not been incarcerated or even mentioned in that sure. regard. Sure. 2020, you did have noob supporters being rounded up in that regard over enforced disappearances. So is this... Um, are we just going through these cycles for sure, or are we actually implementing the recommendations that are coming out of these cycles from 2016 at least and 2011? So those are the questions that they will be asking to the state. Mm. When the state will be under review, questions mm. to do with transitional justice, and it's good that we have a colleague here who's from the International Center for Transitional mm. Justice mm. who has all the facts in terms of how far have we gone mm. in fulfilling those recommendations mm. that the mm. government of the Republic of Uganda accepted or supported in terms of transitional justice. Indeed. Oh, that is Robert Chirenga, the executive director for the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. Let me also bring in an associate, um, pro, um, th that is a program associate at the International Center for Transitional Justice, Mr. Jesse Mugero. He's jo joining me right now. Um, Jesse Mugero, what is transitional justice? Let's start from there. Well, thank you, mm. Remy, and uh, good afternoon, viewers. Uh, transitional justice refers to a series of judicial and non-judicial mechanisms that states implement mm -hmm. to overcome a period of uh, tremendous abuse of human rights mm -hmm. and to transition or to move to a time of more peace, mm -hmm. respect for human rights, mm -hmm. but also putting in place mechanisms to hold perpetrators accountable mm -hmm. and ensure that institutions that were responsible for some of these crimes are purged 
and to ensure a non-reoccurrence of the same. And also transitional justice mechanisms differ from country to country. What works in uh, Colombia may not work in Uganda, what works in South Africa may not work in Egypt or Timor-Leste or any other country. So every country has a specific transitional justice mechanism or processes that are unique to them that would work for them and would bring about a non-reoccurrence uh, of the grave human rights abuses that occurred before. All right, what are some mm -hmm. of those uh, developments in transitional justice in Uganda that you could probably talk about? Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. From a Ugandan perspective, you can uh, start from the 2006 Juba Peace Talks. But for specifically for our discussion here mm -hmm. on the Universal Periodic Review, you could look at uh, the National Transitional Justice Policy, which was set up by the government uh, after accepting some of the recommendations in 2016. Mm -hmm. And even though the policy has been in place, the necessary legislation to make the policy come to life, such as the Transitional Justice Bill, are yet to be passed. Mm. You can talk about the Kasese massacres that mm. occurred, and where even though the prosecutor did do some preliminary investigation, mm. they found that these crimes do not meet the threshold, mm. and as a result, they referred these to the Ugandan uh, prosecutorial services to take over. Mm. So you can notice that uh, Transitional Justice processes in Uganda have mainly focused on northern Uganda, but also now people are recognizing that uh, southwestern Uganda, especially the Kasese area, which had the ADF, is an area which has been brewing with conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, even on a more recent development, we can look at the uh, Ongwen trial at the International Criminal Court, which was uh, where he was convicted. And uh, as per now, we have the Koyelo trial also at the International Crimes Division in Uganda. Mm -hmm. But that has not taken, uh, hasn't gotten much progress mm -hmm. as yet. So we have had mainly a lot of prosecutions, uh, victims demand, a lot of reparations which are yet to be offered. Mm. But we are having some slow movement at the moment. Slow movements. What is actually compounding this slow movement mostly? The slow movements have been, uh, when you look at the court system, maybe mm. at uh, International Crimes Division, the mm. biggest challenge has been the continuous transfer of judicial officers. I see. So you'd find that someone has built expertise, mm. has been trained on international criminal law, mm. and then suddenly they are transferred because that's uh, an administrative procedure within that, uh, within the judiciary of Uganda. All right. Mm. That is Jesse Mugero. He is a program associate at the International Center for Transitional Justice. Let's also bring in Ruth Sechindi, the director, uh, monitoring and inspections at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Now, Uganda has been reviewed twice, 2011 and 2016. We come up for our third review around January, Feb, next year, 2022. Mm -hmm. So are we making any progress as far as transitional justice is concerned here in Uganda? Yes, uh, we're making progress when you look at uh, the legal framework. Um, my colleague Jesse has just talk, uh, taken you through what we have. And uh, because we can, um, because of the legal framework and the institutional framework and a specific court mm. to handle crimes, uh, war crimes and crimes against hum humanity, you realize that uh, as a country there is purposeful interventions to ensure that there is uh, uh, access to justice and transitional justice in the country. I also note that um, after the LRA war, there were a lot of interventions, particularly in northern Uganda, where communities then debated and opted mm. on whether to use traditional mechanisms, the matter put, whether the, we can consider having only the judicial mm. or the semi-judicial. And I think that was very good. The, all the members of the community, the, the religious leaders, the cultural leaders, have been involved in these processes because peace and security are key mm. in every country. Mm. And it's also very good for countries to heal. So uh, having legal frameworks is not good enough. Institutions being in place is not good enough. But ensuring that there's participation and that the people are involved to have that healing uh, through these transitional mm. justice processes is very important. Indeed. So we've made headway. We know that uh, there's been a uh, uh, um, a fee for uh, the, the debt war claimants, mm. and uh, some many have received uh, compensation for what they lost during the war. Uh, many are still claiming, but you see that there's uh, there's an intention and there's progress and there's goodwill on the on, on, on the side of the state.
to ensure that uh, the people of northern Uganda are still saying there hasn't been some form of accountability uh, being accorded to them, courtesy of government, on what really transpired during those 20 years. No accountabilities uh, so far. I think there's been accountability, mm. uh, and that is why we see all these uh, processes coming into mm. play. That's why we see, uh, as a country, we've seen some being given amnesty, because you can't kill everyone, you can't imprison everyone. There has to be some form of amnesty. We've seen that they established the Amnesty Commission, and we have seen people getting amnesty. All those are processes where we are saying, where we see that the state is trying to ensure that, that there's healing mm. in communities. And the communities have been... Uh, have been gr uh, greatly inf informed and involved. We have seen interventions where women and, uh, and uh, former abductees have come, uh, have been brought uh, on board. We've seen processes of healing and cleansing as well as supporting mm. traditional mechanisms uh, for communities, and that is good. Mm. But w we still think that there's a lot more that we can still do as a country. There's still a lot of agitation, I think, we still need more healing. We need to have a true record of exactly what happened as mm. a country. Indeed. We need to know what happened because for you to heal, mm. you have to know the truth. Indeed. And that is why we, you've had people, uh, some communities calling for the Truth Commission. Mm -hmm. That is all part of transitional justice. Mm. People want to know the truth. They want to know where their loved ones uh, went how they disappeared, what happened to them, so that they get that form of closure. Mm. So uh, we have seen efforts by the state to do that, but I think the discussion is still on mm. to have that closure and also for people to feel that they have uh, received justice because justice comes in many forms. Mm. Sometimes it's just forgiveness. It's not always compensation. It's not always uh, prosecution. Mm. It comes in many forms, closure, forgiveness, uh, uh, psychosocial support, I know that uh, civil society and many other organizations have come in to mm -hmm. give people psychosocial support, not only in northern Uganda, but also in areas of Kasese, all this. And uh, for Kasese, the Uganda Human Rights Commission mm -hmm. conducted uh, an investigation and a fact-finding mission mm -hmm. to Kasese, mm -hmm. and uh, we found that a number of issues that caused that conflict after the uh, the 2016 election were really deep-rooted issues mm. that need to be resolved as mm. a country. So you realize that um, we, we, we wrote a report and it's accessible. Mm. Uh, we launched it and it's accessible to the members of public. But we feel that um, mm. as long as the grievances are not addressed, the mm. agitation and discomfort uh, a ripe for a conflict uh, that could occur again. Mm. I'm not a, a prophet of doom, mm. but I think that's what we raised in our report. Mm. So we called on government to address particular pertinent issues that the people of Kasese were clamoring for and have been calling for. And uh, we made very good recommendations in that report. Mm. And I hope those who are working on transitional justice get a copy and look at some of our co uh, recommendations because this conflict dates way back before even Idi Amin, after Indeed. colonialism. Mm. And so there's been agitation and agitation and issues and, uh, that have not been addressed. And they mm. still, they, they, they spill over in every regime that comes into power. So those have to be addressed. Uh, and then we'll be uh, sure. Of course, in, in the case of Northern Uganda, you do have widows who are still grappling with uh, statelessness. They cannot get national IDs or get registered for most of these uh, uh, development initiatives that are cut, that are being put together by government. You also do have many of uh, their children who are also grappling as orphans. They're being chased off the land of their parents who are now since mm -hmm. deceased. Mm -hmm. So many human rights violations have taken center stage. Has government offered redress to these groups of people? Yes, government has, uh, 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 has put uh, in place initiatives to address mm -hmm. this. But if you talk about statelessness, let me just talk about statelessness in, in, in broadly. Mm -hmm. um, any person, it's very easy to be stateless. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have legislation, for example, our current legislation talks about um, if you give birth to a child as a woman and uh, you don't register the child, that registration, the man has to be available, has to go and actually say consider that this is my child so that means uh, if you have single mothers whose husbands or whose boyfriends or partners have not come up to 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 state mm. that actually this child is mine you you can have issues of statelessness um and so 
it's not only in, in northern Uganda, but I think our legal framework has to be reviewed to ensure that we don't have stateless persons in mm. Uganda. We still have people like the Maragoli mm. in Uganda who are contested. Uh, did they come from Ethiopia? Did they come from, from <laughs> Kenya? Did they come to, to build the railway? <laughs> and so their registration has been really contentious. Mm. And so many could not stand for public office. They have had issues of accessing national mm. registration. And you don't take national registration very lightly. It is a very important because it identifies your nationality. And right now, as a country, a national identity is very important mm. uh, for any citizen. So any citizen who is out there and has not registered or does not have an ID, please um, be responsible and go and, and register. Now back to, uh, back to uh, northern Uganda. Mm. I think uh, the local authorities have come, have intervened in many of these mm. uh, these situations, and th they have agreed that if one of the parents is really uh, 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 born and raised an, a national, then many of these children have been considered uh, who have att attained 18. Mm have been registered and have received means. So that is being resolved. It is understandable. And in the case of accountability in Kasese, Lieutenant General Peter Elwelu, the former, land com uh, the former commander of the land force, is still caught scot free. We haven't seen any incarcerations taking center stage on the part of government, all those individuals who orchestrated the heinous attack on the palace, killing more than 100 people. You would need to have a criminal case against him. Hmm. And so you need grounds or to bring an offense that hmm. he's committed. Hmm. Until you prove that, hmm. I, I don't think he has a case yet. Uh, unless you tell me one, and I'm sure police will be happy to, to have that. <laughs> but uh, until you prove that, then mm. he has no criminal case against him for All him right. to be uh, incarcerated. That is Ruth Sechin, the Director of Monitoring and Inspections at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Let's also bring in um, Mr. Robert Arachirenga. He is the ED for the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders right here in Uganda. Are you satisfied with how government has been handling this issue when it comes to transitional justice in the case of Northern Uganda and Kasese, if you will? Uh, thank you, Romeo. To some extent, yes, but a big no because there are things, so many outstanding issues. Mm. In the case of Northern Uganda, I think the right to an effective remedy has not yet been realized. Mm. We still have people grappling with issues of livelihood, mm. the right to land, mm. the right to citizenship, mm. the right to knowing the truth in terms of access to justice. Mm. In terms of Kasese, we still have people who are still detained officials of the palace. Uh, you've mentioned some uh, senior members of the UPDF who others see, see, see to have committed serious crimes and uh, they are scot free. Mm. So how do you convince these people really that they have these rights to an effective remedy when they see the perpetrators Walking are being promoted free. and being scot free mm. and are, are thumping their chests for having done a good job. Mm. So in my view they need to be really uh, transitional justice in such areas so that uh, for you to have peace in the Renzori region, mm. justice mm. must be seen to have been done. Indeed. Uganda underwent the first uh, cycle review in 2011. This was a time when we did see the work to work protests that saw Correct. so many people arrested mm -hmm. and uh, enforced disappearances also took center stage during the time. The second, second cycle review came through in 2016. The same sure. did happen that also culminated mm -hmm. into the Kasese massacre. Now, we are here. 2020, you did see what happened to the Noob supporters, many of whom are still grappling in various safe houses. And you did mention that uh, the state is a vital, vital actor when it comes to the implementation of the Universal Periodic Review. So tell us about some of those recommendations that uh, the government had accepted and those that are just noted, if you will. 143 out of that, 18 deferred, 65 rejected. Yes, there are mm. some recommendations that the government, of the, the government of the Republic of Ghana went was under review took note, and when it says it takes note, mm. it has listened, but doesn't commit itself to taking any action. And there, there are some recommendations that it supported, mm. meaning that it has accepted uh, to put in place those mechanisms. Mm. So some of these recommendations have been partially fulfilled, others have not yet been fulfilled, mm -hmm. especially those that have to do with civil liberties. Indeed. But those to do with social economic rights, they've tried to improve in terms of maternal health, uh, incre increasing on their budget, but those that did touch on civil liberties, there's still a lot of work to be done. In terms of the legislative framework, I think that we have a robust legal regime that protects these civil liberties. But the fundamental question is, are these laws being implemented? 
you realize that all these uh, human rights uh, violations we've been talking about and forced disappearances happened in 2021 when we had a national human rights institution that was redundant. Mm. Up to date, still redundant. We have appointed people, but they haven't taken up uh, the instruments of power in others that are not in office. Mm. So you can see that that is not a priority on the side of it. Uh, do you you have appointed people, yes. mm -hmm. but they haven't sat in office. They haven't taken an oath. Mm. So it's still, it shows you wh what are the priorities. If you have appointed me, when do you want me to take office? Indeed. Indeed, there was no leadership at the Uganda Human Rights Council, meaning they couldn't expedite uh, those tribunals to investigate sure. what actually happened during Neither the Neither could they come out with an, a report that would say this is a Human Rights Commission Indeed, report. Yes, they, they couldn't come up with tribunals to investigate what happened to the Noob supporters sure. during, that, uh, com during the campaigns. You remember what happened in Luka district, the That's November correct. protests that saw so many people being rounded up. We do not have seen any investigations, courtesy of government. Sure. But do you think, um, do you concur with security experts then when they say that this was a deliberate ploy on the part of government to ensure that there is no leadership at the Uganda Human Rights Council so that when these enforced disappearances happen, no state agency would actually go ahead to investigate the same government over these heinous crimes. That's what the picture would portray. Mm. Mm. And really the burden now goes back to the state to really show that it was not deliberate. Mm. Because what exactly is the reason for not appointing the members of the commission? Mm. So to the ordinary citizen, that mm. is the interpretation. Because you see, Unless the state can come out clear to say, look, the reason why we are not able to appoint members of the commission was ABC denied. Since the mm. state has not come out, then we would see that it was not a priority on the side of the state. Mm. Yeah. That is Robert Chirenga, the ED for the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. Jesse Mugero, he is a program associate at the International Center for Transitional Justice. We would like to know whether we've, as a country, made any progress when it comes to ensuring transitional justice over the last five years. Mm. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, when you notice in 2016, right. when uh, Uganda was being reviewed at mm. uh, the UPR process, mm. Uganda accepted three recommendations and noted one, mm. and all these four are key for transitional justice. Mm. Number one on the right to an effective remedy, the government did accept that, and as I noted, they have tried to come up with some legal framework, but mm. mainly at a policy level. Mm. What is left is to ensure that this policy becomes reality by being implemented to become a law. Mm. For example, the Transitional Justice Bill becoming an act. Uh, the Amnesty Act or the Amnesty Commission right. uh, is to continue to do its work normally. Uh, on a second note, uh, on the issue of the right to, st right to nationality for children, born of war, you realize that not much. The Northern Uganda is. Specifically mm. Northern Uganda, mm. because you realize most of these women were victims of sexual violence Indeed. uh we are kept as sexual slaves so you may not necessarily call them even married mm. uh, people who are raped and so forth so they have children and these children are now back in uganda mm. they want to access normal services they want to go to school mm. but you can see the dilemma they are in because they don't they cannot access a national id you go to the nearer office they'll ask you questions like who is your father mm. Uh, questions which are impossible for an answer to be got. Mm. So recommendations have been made to NIRA that laws, that a law reform be made to ensure that people in peculiar circumstances, such as children born of war, are given an exception so that they can be registered at least. Mm. Mm. Uh, when you look at the matter of enforced disappearances, you will notice that though the government was aware, it just noted this in 2016. And uh, noted is a diplomatic way of saying we are listening, we may act, mm. we, or we may not. So you'll notice that the trend of enforced disappearance is not new. No, it wasn't just in 2016, but as you have, you have noted, mm. even in the postmath of the elections, which were very violent, but also it's a historical issue which has been used by uh, even other past regimes. But if you listen to the president, it's like he's telling us enforced disappearances actually started in 2020 with the no mm. problem taking center <laughs> stage. So largely that wasn't true. Go ahead. <laughs> that was a real surprise to, to hear such a statement Indeed. because uh, uh, a record is there. Mm. I mean, there's, if there's anecdotal evidence mm. of people who, were, who came from safe houses, mm -hmm. political supporters of other political parties Indeed. who were just dumped elsewhere and they'll just narrate mm. and say, I was put in such and such a place. Mm. So there's, uh, there's anecdotal, anecdotal evidence. Indeed. Uh, what are, unfortunately, there hasn't been any follow up in terms of criminal prosecutions to hold those accountable. Mm. And uh, finally, there has been uh, also Uganda did accept the recommendation to ensure that uh, victims of conflict-related sexual violence mm -hmm. get justice. 
However, not much has been done for these victims. And although a parliamentary resolution was passed a couple of years ago, mm. it hasn't been followed up. So these victims are still grappling. We have uh, made recommendations that at least they be provided with uh, free medical care to ensure that those wounds of the war, psychological and physical, are mm. taken care of, but also to, to prosecute those accountable, because when you prosecute, it sends a message that this is not acceptable and you ought to be punished. Mm. Out of the 143 recommendations, Jesse Mugero, you, uh, Uganda did uh, defer 18 and rejected mm. 65. I do understand one of mm. most of those recommendations among the 65 were equally important. Name at least two of them, or one, that we should actually not in this regard, and why government was actually sidelining these recommendations. I think number one, specifically for transitional justice, mm. is the issue of enforced disappearances, mm. where the government noted it, but Uganda is a signatory mm. to the International Convention Against Enforced Disappearances, though it is yet to ratify that convention. If Uganda had ratified that convention, what would it mean? Well, that would mean that there would be more transparency to know mm. who has been detained in which place. Mm. But also that would give power to the working group on enforced disappearances to come into the country mm. and have access at any time any of the official places of detention. So that was the government's biggest fear, that when we do actually ratify this convention, these actors will be coming into the country and assessing whether or not safe houses do exist. Well, for a country which is law-abiding, for a country which is democratic, <laughs> transparency should be at the bedrock <laughs> of uh, implementation of law. A very insightful conversation I'm having with Jesse Mugero, Robert Chirenga, and also Ruth Sechindi from the Uganda Human Rights Commission. We shall take a very short break, but return shortly with this conversation, largely focusing on the universal periodic review. We'll be right back. Welcome back and many thanks for staying with us right here on NTV Uganda. My name is Romeo Busik. Of course, we are continuing this conversation largely focusing on the Universal Periodic Review. Uganda's third cycle review is coming in 2022 around January or February tentatively. We do expect the state report to be coming out in October, that is next month. Uh, before this conversation, I had tasked Ruth Sechindi, the Director of Monitoring and Inspections at the Uganda Human Rights Commission, to actually help us preempt uh, some of the contents of this document. But then she said we should wait for the public document to come out in October. But for now, let's talk about what has been happening at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. The vacuum as far as leadership is concerned and the fact that they couldn't expedite tribunals during the campaigns that took center stage or to investigate cases of human rights violations in this country. Yes, a very good afternoon once again, Ruth Sechindi. Um, help, help us understand what is happening at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. There was a leadership vacuum at some point. You couldn't expedite tribunals or investigate in any of the human rights violations that took center stage during the election why did that take center stage and why was government dilly darling when it comes to the institution of the leadership at uganda human rights commission was it deliberate like uh, robert chirenga contends uh, thank you i don't think it was deliberate mm. uh the the i have to say that uh, in 2016 mm. we lost the uh our former chairperson Medicago. yes Rest and uh, we also know that uh, one of our members ran for political office mm. and became uh, a member of parliament and later on a minister. Mm. So, and, and yet before, prior to that, we also had vacant positions. Mm. We had lost uh, a member of the commission, uh, Honorable uh, Joseph Etima, and, and other uh, members were still, um, whose contracts had expired. Mm. So we had a vacuum. We only had five members, uh, sorry, three members, and so uh, we were missing five mem four members. Okay, um, but that is n did not stop the commission from functioning. The mm -hmm. institution, by virtue of the constitution, still existed because it was created mm -hmm. by uh, the constitution and an act of parliament. So what w was lacking really was quorum, and because we don't we didn't have quorum. Mm -hmm. The tribunals stalled. We could not handle tribunals. And also, uh, we could not uh, present the annual state of human rights in the country mm. because the, the law requires that it has to be the chairperson. Mm. And we didn't have a chairperson. So those were the two main issues 
or, or activities that were really affected. Now, people need justice. Tribunals could not uh, happen. However, all the other mandates of the commission continued. We continued to investigate and receive complaints. Mm. We observed the election. So the investigations that you're talking about mm. that came, that were coming in, have been uh, investigated. We are just waiting for the appointment, mm. sorry, for the swearing in of mm. the newly appointed members yes. so that they can start <coughs> hearing tri sorry, the tribunals. Mm. And so I don't think that, uh, I think, that, Robert, that was a conspiracy theory to start uh, presuming or thinking that mm. uh, there was something sinister intended to, uh, to, to, to affect the human rights in this country. No. In fact, while mm. all this was happening, our members who still existed were releasing press statements about the human rights situation and issues that were happening. But they couldn't we investigate continued the same. No, we were mm. investigating them. We were investigating every human rights violation that was happening in this country. The record is very, is very clear. We were writing the reports and the files for the complaints are ready just to be heard. So it is not true that the commission or otherwise would be getting earning a salary for nothing. Mm. So it is not true that nothing was happening. There are people, young men and women, who are working tirelessly to ensure that there's observance and protection. So you could investigate, country. find out that person yes. X was the perpetrator, but then you couldn't bring them to the tribunal to actually cross-examine them to see so whether or not the allegations the are true. hearing is what is lacking. The tribunal, the which most is important like the part. court. Mm. All parts are important in the processes. Mm. Every part feeds into the other. So uh, unfortunately, the dispensation of justice has been delayed mm. because of the tribunal. And so we're anxiously waiting for the swearing in of our members Everyone to start is. hearing. Yes, I'm glad you are. Especially the civil society and NGOs. Well, <laughs> 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 politicians yeah. in NUP, DP, and all the other opposition political parties. Go ahead. So uh, once the tribunal kick off, I'm mm. sure many people's cases will be heard. Yeah. But the good news is that most of the investigations have been completed. Um, and just to go take us back to the UPR, mm. as a commission, uh, we, uh, the UN... But the viewer would like to know, did mm. the leadership vacuum affect the role of the commission in advancing the UPR mechanism? No, no. Yes, we'd want the, the, mm. the leaders to be there. Mm. But uh, we still have some members who also who are currently providing the leadership role. Mm. We would have loved, uh, well, I can't say not absolutely because we don't have a chairperson. And once a team is around, of course, there's always something fundamentally right that they bring on the table. Mm. We want to bring the expertise. Mm. We know that the incoming chairperson, uh, 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 Miss Maria Mwangadia is a brilliant lady. So we, we, we've missed out on that. <coughs> but then we also had a team uh, at the commission and also uh, the, the other leaders who are in the core in the core in the commission the other members who have given strategic guidance on the process of the UPR and uh, the UN requires us to also advise the state and uh, and be part of the processes so we had consultations as a commission the active the members who are there or who are with us have been very active with regard to the consultations, <coughs> compiled an independent report on how we see things and how the recommendations were implemented. And, uh, and we, uh, we followed up, we've been following up on uh, the state report. Hmm. And, and I think all has been going on very well. We're happy about that. Hmm. So uh, as required by the UN, yes, we have been there. We have advised. We have uh, followed the processes. We have been part of the consultations. <coughs> we have consulted ourselves to make sure that the report, our reports are truthful. All and right. also the state report is as truthful mm -hmm. as possible. And we've also worked with civil society to, because the, they also have an alternative report to hear what civil society has to say, to hear the recommendations on how to say. Mm. And we've pointed out some of these things because uh, it's important for all Ugandans, for the good of our country. Some of the, the recommendations are amazing also for, from the civil society. Mm. So we've been part of the process. So, Ruth Sejindi, when you hear that Uganda accepted 143 recommendations, deferred 18 and rejected 65, one of whom actually touches the issue of enforced disappearances, wouldn't you agree with people like Robert Chirenga and other security experts who actually say maybe the 
um, government dilly darling when it comes to the institution of Uganda human rights leadership was actually a deliberate ploy because they knew enforced disappearances were going to continue, especially in 2016. Going forward in 2021, as we hold the national election, they knew enforced disappearance would continue and actually accepting that recommendation would have been detrimental to the government because it would have allowed these actors to come into the country and see whether or not actually these safe houses exist. So they were not actually letting, going to let that happen. Okay, um, in 2019, mm. the Uganda Human Rights Commission monitored, inspected, and tried to find all the safe houses in Uganda. And we have written a report mm. on our findings. Oh, yeah. And we also noted that as a country, safe houses, you could attribute it to the commission's intervention. Mm -hmm. We've had various engagements with security agencies and uh, we've, uh, we called on the closure of safe houses and uh, as a country, safe houses by 2019 safe houses were no more. Uh, w there were issues of, because we called and said if someone is, uh, has committed a f an offense, take them through the criminal justice processes produce them before police and courts of law will determine their, uh, uh, whether they are guilty or not. So that they are not put in, uh, in uh, detained in common cardo mm. or detained in uh, where there's no communication about them. Mm. And so we called on, 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 on government to inf ensure that. But I don't think that there's a conspiracy, like Robert <laughs> here is saying, I don't think there was a conspiracy theory that members were not appointed because of elections. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't subscribe to that. I don't think so. Because with or without, we still came up with press statements. We still condemned certain acts. <coughs> uh, we still investigated uh, violations of human rights abuse. We still uh, uh, sensitized. We still mm. continued with everything except for the tribunals. Mm. So it is not true that members were not appointed just because there was something sinister or something by the state to mm. hide. I don't subscribe to that. Um, I should also say that uh, Uganda uh, uh, is a s signed off but has not ratified the International Covenant on Enforced Disappearances. Mm. So when you see some of those things, uh, you see you see that there's a willingness on the state to do certain things. However, as a country and uh, as a national emergency institution, we only call upon the state to ratify mm -hmm. the instrument and also ensure that uh, acts of enforced disappearances stop. And that if someone has committed uh, an offense, you don't have to put them in a drone. It would be right to take them through the criminal justice processes as established by the Constitution mm -hmm. and our laws of Uganda because at the end of the day, we are guided by the laws that are uh, enacted by the Parliament. By parliament. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at our Constitution, we have four non-derogable rights. And, and these are absolute freedoms or rights that we have in Uganda, not even your right to life is absolute. But the right, freedom from torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, mm. the right from slavery and, and servitude, uh, absolute, the right to a fair, a free and fair hearing is absolute, mm. okay? Yeah. And the right to have your scopus. But the right to a fair hearing is absolute. And that means when you detain someone in Comincado, when there's enforced disappearance and you take someone in a drone and their people, their people don't know where they are, you are violating a fundamental rights as a country. Mm -hmm. Oh, and because the other, the other, I think the fourth, I think I repeated the other, is uh, freedom from torture, cruel, and human, mm -hmm. inhuman and degrading treatment. So when acts of torture are happening in places that are unknown, then you also are violating an absolute freedom and absolute right mm -hmm. of someone. So that is why we have come out as a, as, a, as a commission to condemn these acts and say that these are f uh, absolute freedoms and absolute rights we should be respected by all organs of government as also provided under Article 44 and 45 of the Constitution. Ruth Sechindi, she is the Director of Monitoring and Inspections at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Let's bring in the ED for the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders Uganda. Robert Chirenga, let's talk about uh, civil society participation in the UPR process. Share with us a little about the C CSO UPR process. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, the UPR process is supposed to be a consultative process. Indeed. It is state-driven, but also consultative. So you bring in many 
actors, civil society, mm. the human the United Nations country team, and uh, other international organizations that could mm. be working on different human rights organizations. So the role of civil society basically is to provide what we'd call a shadow report in looking and analyzing what government has been able to do in terms of fulfilling its mm. obligations. Mm. So right from the time the working group adopts the report on Uganda, we start looking at how by monitoring, reporting, and do documenting and reporting, has government of Uganda fulfilled this recommendation that it supported? To what, ac to what extent has it <coughs> fulfilled that? So we look at that. And we consult ministries, departments, and agencies of governments when we are compiling these mm. reports, and we provide our shadow report. As a coalition, we are the coordinating entity. So we have about 23 cluster groups that mm. we coordinate and make sure that they compile their reports on civil liberties, civil and political liberties, social, economic, and cultural rights, mm. the group rights, environmental rights, and the right to development. And therefore, they all come together and compile the cluster reports, which is all consolidated into one report mm. known as the shadow report. And that shadow report comes before uh, the United Nations, before the state report. So mm. the state report is coming in out, I think, either mid-October or end of October, mm. whereas we'll ours by that. July we had already submitted that mm. report. So mm. basically, uh, states are encouraged to work with civil society in terms of uh, this concern. They process. are encouraged, but are they showing good political will to work with the civil society organizations vis-a-vis -vis NGOs? We've been seeing a shrinking civic space within this country. Robert Chirenga, you do have a clampdown that has been meted out on NGOs that are in the areas of governance and accountability. We've seen NGOs being shut down. In their big numbers, they're being shut down. NGOs that would have helped you, this country in its universal periodic review process process. Now, it seems like there's no goodwill, Robert. That, that, that's why I was uh, insisting, although my co colleague calls it a mm. conspiracy theory, mm. that in the absence of a national, an effective national human rights institution, civil society came and filled in that gap. And you were also hit And then we hit her. Mm. And then, so to answer your question, it's a case of one step forward, two step back. Mm. It seems like government was not on one side, government shows you it's willing to work with civil society in the sense that it, the legal regime is such that civil society can work. We have the constitution under Article 38 that allows us to the right to participate in the governance affairs of our country. But do you see how um, uh, the ploy is unfolding? You ensure that the leadership of the Uganda Human Rights Commission is not working verifiably. Exactly. And you also you ensure that the NGOs that would have offered oversight in accountability and lead, uh, accountability and governance spheres is are under also threat. under shackles. The democratic governance facility and, therefore and you the have NGOs a virtue. they were funding. And therefore you create a virtue. Without funding you can't work. That's true. Go ahead. So those are the issues that we continue to So highlight. how are you going to work with the government if well, they are not allowing you we have to have no space choice. to do that? We have no choice but continue to remind them of their obligation. Mm. And uh, we even have to tell them that uh, the civic space they are trying to, 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 to narrow or uh, to restrict is, to, is counterproductive. Mm. Because civil society contributes quite a lot to the economic development of this country. So it's until that we keep on reminding them, maybe one day they will realize what we're telling them. But there's no way that the state can really operate without civil Indeed. society in terms of complementing. So how agenda. best can we create a conducive political environment that would allow government to work hand in hand with civil society in advancing the goals of the universal periodic review or human rights protection, if you will? Very good, Romain. The best is to have a civil, an honest civil discourse Indeed. on the governance issues in this country. And until we really accept to sit down. I mean, look at it. By the time even structures such as the the iPod mm. uh, breaks down, shows you that really people are not willing. There's an element of mis suspicion and mistrust. Mm. So it's important that the state accepts that this country is owned by all who live in it. I hear you. And therefore, they should allow everybody to come up with ideas and discuss. Mm. So until we have a very, uh, uh, a very honest civil discourse, mm. we continue to have these challenges. So it's important to hear one side, uh, every side of the story and say, look, how can we come together as citizens of this country to push the development agenda? Jesse Muguero, the program associate at the International Center for Justice, is going to be telling us some of the recommendations that proposed to government to that effect. What are some of those? Well, on the right to an effective remedy, we mm. have proposed that the government puts in place a legislation to support the transitional justice policy. Yes, yes. A lot of pieces of legislation which are mm. pending, the witness protection bill, to ensure that witnesses who go to testify in these international crimes mm. uh, get protection. 
uh, the reparations bill to ensure that there is an orderly way in which reparations are given out by government, mm. whether through court processes mm. or through administrative measures as well. Uh, on the right to ensure that children get uh, their nationality and are registered, mm. we have recommended to NIRA that they come up with a law reform which will ensure that persons who were victims of sexual violence yes. are not put at the same criteria as other people. For example, some of the requirements could be phased out or they could find a way to contextualize mm. which information would work best to ensure that they also register these children who are born as a result of sexual violence. Mm. Then on the issue of enforced disappearances, as uh, my colleague Robert said, we are reminding the government of its obligations. Uganda is a signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Chapter 4 of the Constitution of Uganda has a number of of uh, rights mm. which are taken away when someone is disappeared. Mm. And first disappearance has become like an octopus crime, which can affect very many human rights. So mm. we have recommended and we have reminded the government of its obligation mm. to ensure that people are not disappeared. And so we are encouraging them to ratify the International Covenant uh, against the first disappearances. And then on the issue of uh, <laughs> to, on the issue of, yeah. uh, repa of reparation, mm. I think I've already mentioned that mm. uh, there needs to be proper legislation in place mm. to ensure that people get reparations. And also to ensure that uh, institutions are reformed. Mm. So that when a Ugandan citizen goes to report at uh, the police, they are not afraid that they may, they may have a retaliatory action mm. against them. Mm. Yes. Go ahead. Mm. Ruth Sechende, she is the Director of Monitoring and Inspections at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. We are talking about some recommendations that will help her commission to actually expedite its work in its entirety. What kind of tools do you want government to advance to you as the Uganda Human Rights Commission to be able to uh, expedite your duties without any, any problems in that regard? We've been expediting our problems <laughs> without any, any problem. Hmm. All we need is but the members to be But you've been crying that you needed the leadership at the Uganda Human All Rights Commission. All we need Commission. is for the members your people did not have contracts, they were expiring, Probably. but now things are getting better. But you're saying that things were already better. We know your organization was in tatters. No, it hasn't Ruth. been. Uh, what do you de how do you define tatters? Staff had their contracts expiring. If you hadn't uh, appointed Wanga, dear, as the chairperson, uh, okay. most of these people are going to lose their jobs. You know, you paint a very bad picture, mm. which is not the reality. And even when the staff contracts were expired, mm. We wrote to a Ministry of Justice for guidance mm. and we extended their contracts. Mm. So the, the, the commission has been in one place. We have had three members mm. who were providing strategic guidance and the staffing, the management has been in place. Indeed. So it is, uh, um, it may be uh, fulfilling maybe to you to make it seem like it was in shambles, but unfortunately it is not. And uh, as a, f a matter of fact, mm. we have continued with our mandate okay. in every aspect. Uh, we have kept the institution going. And I'm sure that uh, the an incoming chairperson will find it in a, in a good place. All right. Because if you're saying it's in shambles or in, ta in tatters, I mm. think that is too harsh. Mm. The only thing that we didn't have was quorum. Indeed. And uh, it's the, the tribunal and the annual report that suffered. But mm. uh, the receiving of complaints, investigations mm. of complaints, advisories, review, view of bills, creating awareness, mm. the mandate of the commission continued as was. And uh, I was required because the staffing didn't change. Mm -hmm. We still had some members. And we all want this institution for the good of this country. Indeed. We need that oversight role for the good of this country. And we try to keep it together so that the new leadership comes and finds something that is strong and not in crumbles. And I think we, uh, uh, the, the members that were there and the management have done a good job mm. uh, on that. But um, back to the UPR. I just want to, uh, to, to, to inform the public that the UPR is very important for our country. Mm. It is important because it creates a platform for accountability for our country, Uganda. Mm. Because while we have many accountability, uh, accountability uh, 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 structures and mechanisms, we have courts of law, we have uh, uh, international, uh, other international mechanisms that, like treaty bodies. Right independent experts mm. and all that. The mm. UPR comes in as a peer review process where fellow states mm.
talk to a colleague or a fellow state and re makes recommendations and points out uh, shortfalls and errors of a state. And as such, the UPR is well received by many mm. states. So we as a state we welcome this accountability mechanism because it's another platform where we highlight the human situation in the country or gaps that need mm. to be addressed. So when other, it's like having colleagues, your peers mm. telling you, you know what, clean up this. Oh, you know yeah, what, yeah. I think you listen to them better than the police telling you, mm. uh, fix that car. <coughs> so uh, 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 the UPR then comes in as a very mm. welco uh, uh, welcomed mechanism for many countries. And it's a mechanism that we have seen that we have noted that works. As Ugandans, we should interest ourselves in this mechanism because we are able to speak where it has failed at home then our colleagues or other states are able to uh, to speak to the same. Indeed. And, this, we have uh, and the role of your commission, indeed, yes. Rutsa Chindi, cannot be downplayed. <laughs> but then there's a problem that is coming in, Rutsa Chindi. Mm -hmm. There are plans to merge the Equal Opportunities Commission with the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Don't you think that would dampen your resolve when it comes to advancing the goals of the Universal Periodic Review or even monitoring of human rights in this country? I think it will make us stronger. Stronger? Yeah. With the Equal Opportunities because, Commission? Because uh, Equal Opportunities are the foundation of, the fo foundation of human rights. It's equal Opportunities are, are human rights. Mm. So when we talk about equality and non-discrimination, mm. when you go to Article 1 of the UDA Universal Declaration of Human Rights, mm. the first one is about non-discrimination mm. and equality. So when you merge and bring Equal Opportunities back home, mm. You're bringing them where, exactly where the, we belong, and that is the Human Rights Commission. We shall be stronger mm. in dealing with issues of human rights. When we're dealing with issues of marginalization, mm. when, when we're dealing with issues of discrimination, mm. issues of gender, All right. we shall be stronger with having one voice Indeed. with the expertise, and I, I, I have no problem. Indeed. I think it will make the two institutions stronger. Right. So Thank it's an opportunity for us. Thank you very much, Ruth Sechindi. And <laughs> last recommendations coming in from the National Coalition of Human rights defenders. Robert, what are some of those recommendations coming in from your coalition? Well, from the coalition, we want to see an honest debate mm. with the state to ensure that really these recommendations uh, are fulfilled and uh, the country makes progress. Mm. It is true some progress has been made, but a lot needs to be done. And uh, we won't shy to continue knocking on uh, the state's door to remind that of its tripartite obligations. One, to respect human rights, mm -hmm. two, to protect human rights, and three, to fulfill human rights. And with that, I think we'll be able to move this country some strides forward. And with that, we've come to the end of this conversation that was largely uh, by Robert Chirenga, the ED for the National Coalition of uh, uh, Human Rights Defenders in Uganda. Also, Ruth Sechindi, the Director of Monitoring and Inspections at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. And finally, Jesse Mugero, the Program Associate at the International Center for Transitional Justice. Uganda is up for its third review that is in January or February, tentatively, of 2022. We are waiting for the state report in October of this coming month in that regard. So more of these conversations or interviews are going to be taking center stage to acquaint the viewer or the citizen in this country about the machinations of the Universal Periodic Review ahead of 2022. Have yourselves a blessed day.